you. Welcome to episode 10 of One Step Beyond, a show about positively engaging with the world outside our door. Whether it's to hike a local trail or cycle up a mountain, travel to a new country or, more likely right now, explore culture close to home, swim across a nearby lake or maybe take on your first triathlon, One Step Beyond encourages you to take a step outside your comfort zone and enrich your life. My name's Tony Fletcher, and in this episode, I talk to a relatively new friend of mine, British sculptor Peter Naylor, about his self-supported attempt to recreate a physically demanding slice of ancient Greek history, and why he went back to do it again a year later. It's a fascinating and funny story, and I hope you'll find full of the necessary self-deprecation with which we should all tackle our goals. If you're a frequent listener to One Step Beyond, you'll be aware that the show took a week off from its advertised fortnightly schedule. Hey, it's the summer, and for all that the global pandemic prevents me travelling overseas right now, I managed to steal the second of two quick getaways, this time to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. As with the beaches of Rhode Island just a few weeks beforehand, this was my first time vacationing in that northeastern US state, and I have to tell you, that for all that I love my native Catskill Mountains here in New York, I was blown away by the breadth and depth and variety of the outdoor offerings on hand. Over the course of just three full days, I first had fun at the Lost River Gorge, and if you know it, then yes of course I managed to suck my way through the lemon squeeze, the narrowest of its many narrow cave entrances. I got myself out on the smallest bit of the Appalachian Trail just to say I'd been on it, and with my partner did a hike up Artist Bluff and Bald Mountain, and then Mount Pemigewasset, a fantastic mile and a half, 1200 foot elevation climb, with the most amazing views from the ledge on top. And of course, no visit to the White Mountains would be complete without paying some sort of homage to Mount Washington, at just over 6,000 feet, the tallest in the northeast, and known beyond that for some of the freakiest weather on the entire planet with wind speeds of over 200 miles an hour on a bad day. We didn't visit on a bad day, but it did rain just as we reached the top, and the wind kicked up somewhat, and visibility was like zero. Driving back down, yeah, I'm afraid I didn't hike or, God forbid, run this one, the skies cleared, and at around 5,000 foot elevation we encountered a double rainbow, with the lower one beneath us in the valley. It may be for that reason that the rainbow revealed itself as the most incredibly vivid I've ever witnessed in my life. I got a picture of myself sitting on a protruding rock, seemingly beneath it, though we were most certainly somewhere over the rainbow. With the sun obviously having come back out by now, we pointed the car back to the top of the mountain, and of course the clouds and rain returned with us. That was fine. I planned to go back sometime soon, I hope, and ascend it on foot as so many others were doing that day. And hopefully, I won't be one of the three people who lost their lives in the attempt last year. Meantime, we were bowled away by the people we met taking on the Appalachian Trail, meaning the whole thing, from Georgia to Maine. You could distinguish them from regular day hikers by the somewhat vacant look in their eyes, and if not that, then the smell. Hiking the 2,190 mile distance is the kind of thing you don't just need a lot of deodorant for. But unless your name is Scott Jurek, you need a lot of time for it too. Although it has proven for some a pretty effective way of seeing out the pandemic, purposefully or not. We met a girl at the foot of Mount Musilaki, if I've got the name right, who had started the hike in March, promptly started dating a fellow hiker inviting the question, how do you start dating when you're out on a hike? I mean, do you text each other with an invite to hang out that evening? Sadly, she caught Lyme disease, was forced to retreat back to Florida, and eventually drove up to New Hampshire here to help support her boyfriend through the last few hundred miles. Judging by the incredible inclines of the White Mountains and the considerable lengths between road intersections, that guy would have needed all the support he could get. 
The sheer scale of the Appalachian Trail makes my own athletic endeavours this summer seem rather paltry by comparison. But as I mentioned briefly at the end of the last episode, I took a certain pride and satisfaction out of completing the Escarpment Trail run course, unsupported of necessity due to the race's cancellation. The lack of aid stations and my related failures of fuel properly pretty much destroyed me. And yet within days, I found myself revisiting my steps in my dreams and planning my next excursion and how I would improve upon this last one. I've had similar visions of returning to Mount Kilimanjaro, the ascension of which last summer was the original inspiration for this podcast. And I think it's a natural human trait. The hardest and most painful things in our lives are the ones that we nonetheless choose to revisit because we know the rewards are worth it even if those rewards are purely personal and internal. As humans, I think most of us just do want to be better, do better, test ourselves and improve upon that. Well, that's the idea behind this show at any rate. And it's the story of Peter Naylor and his late life decision to recreate some ancient Greek history. Rather than set up the story any further than that, I'm going to jump right into our interview, which, as so often these days, was conducted by Zoom, and which, as usual for this show, I've edited and then supplied narrations for length and clarity. So however and wherever this finds you in the world, kick back and get ready to go. One step beyond! So Peter, welcome to One Step Beyond. I met you it would have been probably in January of 2018 when I was back in the UK for the best part of a month taking care of some issues with my mother. I decided to join the local running group uh, in, in earnest and actually have a bit of a social life. And I don't know if it's the universe or if I have a good nose for things, but the two people I ran with over uh, the first couple of runs I've ended up becoming good friends with. And and you're one of them. That's that's Bev- <laughs> Beverly in, in Northern England, uh, in Yorkshire. And um, you had an amazing story, which is what I want to talk about today. But give me a little bit of background about yourself, who you are and what you do for a day job, assuming you still have one in this uh, current environment. Yes, I do. Yes, more or less, kind of. Yes, my wife sort of thinks I'm retired, but really, it's just that I'm idle, really. Um, Yeah, I spent most of my life as a teacher. I started as an art teacher, uh, but I went abroad, became an English as a foreign language teacher, spent 25 years in the Middle East. But we've been back in England now for 16 years. And since coming back, I've kind of restarted my art aspect and I've become a a sculptor, which is a fairly kind of erratic work. Uh, I specialise in public memorials. So the commissions are kind of few and far between. But it's been an incredibly uh, satisfying job, really. yeah, I mean, you're touching people's hearts on some of the things. Uh, I won't go into it all, but yeah, you have to look on my website to see uh, the work. And it's just, yeah, really rewarding. So that's what that's what I do, yes. When we were uh, running that day, it was just a midweek sort of semi-long, semi-long run. And uh, you got telling me that you had just completed something that is kind of known but very few people really know the details basically you went to greece to follow in the footsteps of and i'm going to let you pronounce it because i probably will get it wrong the um i guess the runner who famously ran from athens to sparta to get help from the spartans in the athenians battle against the persians back in 490 bc if i have all of that correct do we know that that story is is true it's believed to be fairly accurate. It's in Herodotus, if you know Herodotus, the father of history. And he was writing only about 30, 40 years after the event. So he will have actually been talking to people that were there. So, you know, as well as one can say for something that's so long ago, with reasonable confidence that his report is accurate. And yes, it's about Pheidippides is the he, in a sense, is a professional runner. The, the Greek army had, you know, professional runners, the couriers of the day, really. And uh, Pheidippides is sent off by Athens to Sparta to go and see if they will come and help them fight the Persians at the battle of what becomes the Battle of Marathon. 
Um, Pheidippides, bless him, not only does he run to Sparta, but he also runs back again. A little bit of ancient history here. Bear with me, it's fascinating. And for all that I hope, every one of my listeners has a strong natural aversion to war. We can't alter the fact that this battle took place, nor that it was an incredibly decisive one. And indeed, the very first one to be recorded as part of contemporary history. The Persians had the ruling empire of the time, and the army they brought to Marathon, by sea, was perhaps 25,000 strong, including archers from Africa, infantrymen from Eastern Europe, and cavalry. Greece, on the other hand, was a series of 10 or 11 city-states, each of which supplied an army of approximately 1,000 men, and each of which was fighting to defend its homeland and its way of life. But for all that they may have had the motivation, and were able to halt the Persian advance, they were outnumbered at least two to one, and so the Athenian generals sent Pheidippides to rally the Spartans, the largest of the city-states outside of Athens, to the impending battle. Pheidippides duly set off on his 150-mile run, and at the other end he found the Spartans willing and able, but not ready. They were in the middle of a religious feast, and insisted they would only come to Marathon after the full moon had passed. So Pheidippides ran all the way back to Marathon, just another 150 miles or so, only to find out that the Athenians had seized an opportunity to wage the battle in his absence, and against all apparent odds, had won. In fact, they positively routed the Persians, losing all of about 200 men to the 6,500 Persians that they slaughtered. Whether it was before or after the Battle of Marathon, the Persians loaded their horses back on their ships and set sail to attack Athens itself. So, according to legend, poor Pheidippides was promptly sent to run from Marathon to Athens to warn the city chiefs about this, as well as to announce victory from the Battle of Marathon. That same legend then has it that after covering 300 miles, these 25 additional miles were somehow too much for him, and Pheidippides dropped dead upon reaching Athens and announcing the news. This last run is, however, almost certainly an amalgam of stories at best, and a myth at worst. There is nothing in Herodotus, the history, that says that Pheidippides runs from Marathon to Athens and pronounces that they've won the battle. So that's probably just a romantic edition. That romantic edition was largely popularised by the Victorian poet Robert Browning in 1879, in a poem titled for the run of Pheidippides. Nonetheless, within two decades, the Olympic Games had been revised and the 25-mile run from Marathon to Athens included as a crown jewel. The additional 1.2 miles of modern marathon fame was added in the London Olympics of 1908 for convoluted reasons. Bet you didn't know that. And on the subject of what you may not have known, did we mention how fast Pheidippides apparently ran from Marathon to Sparta? What is also documented in Herodotus is that he, he sets off early in the morning of one day and he gets to Sparta the following day, which is why <laughs> it's, it's the catch to it all that you're supposed to, if you're going to run the Mar- Spartathlon, sorry, you're supposed to do it. They've set this 36-hour time limit because that's what Pheidippides did it in. The Spartathlon to which Peter refers came about after an RAF wing commander, John Foden, set off with three friends in 1982 to see if it was possible to cover the distance from Marathon to Sparta in the kind of time attributed to Pheidippides. They discovered that it was, the fastest of them covering it in 36 hours, and Foden established the race the following year. It's been run annually ever since. What is even more impressive, though, the actual record for the Spartathlon, and it was actually done by the the first, on the very first Spartathlon, it's a Greek guy, he holds the the four fastest times, and he did it in 20 and a half hours. 20 and a half hours, six marathons. We, we are aware that people can do, you know, certain people are cut out to do superhuman things, but I could, that, that's not the nature really of this show, going off to find that, you know, that Greek athlete who could do that. What was, what was your interest in this? Was it hist- historical or was it running or was it both? 
Uh, I suppose a bit of both. Um, I have always been very interested in Greek mythology. And years ago, when I was in, the first time I was in Saudi Arabia, I was there as a bachelor. I wasn't married, I was there as a bachelor. And just for the heck of it, a friend and I studied ancient Greek literature. Not in, I don't speak Greek, so it was in English. But we read, you know, Homer's The Odyssey, The Iliad, Herodotus. I found it all very interesting. And when I left Saudi the first time, I was only, uh, how old was I, 32, and I'm more or less hitched home, really. I backpacked home from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, Turkey, and through Greece. And because I'd done this um, Greek, ancient Greek study, I thought, oh, look, there's three ancient Greek things that I can do as I'm going home. One is to swim the Hellespont, which is the water divide between Asia and Europe and is a traditional is a supposedly a Greek mythological swim. The other is to climb Mount Olympus in Greece, which is the highest mountain in Greece and is supposed to be the home of the gods. And then the other was to run the classic marathon in from Marathon to Athens. I won't go into the swim in the Hellespont. I very nearly killed myself there. The water was far too cold. I was at the wrong time of the year. It was May and you get the Russian rivers that melt off from the Russian rivers coming from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean and the water was freezing and I got hypothermia and there's kind of three hours missing from my life that I don't know anything about. I couldn't climb Mount Olympus for the same reason. It was still covered in snow so you weren't allowed up it. Uh, so that just left the marathon. So when I was in Athens, yeah, I just put on my running gear, stuck a hundred drachma note down my sock and got the bus to marathon, got off the bus and ran back to Athens. This is an absolute solo running. There is no organization involved in this. Nobody's there to help me. There are no water stations. Uh, when I tell runners in the running club in Beverly, they just think it's stupid, really, that you run 26 miles without a water station, um, especially in that kind of temperature, really. Uh, but, yeah, no, it was fine, and I, I really enjoyed doing it in a crazy kind of way. It was shortly before I met you, uh, I guess it was in 2017, that you went and actually did the Sparta run. Now, you mentioned that there is a, there is a race, but the race was set up literally what two and a half thousand years after the uh after the original run you went off to do it unsupported so what was the thinking behind going just and can you take us through that thinking was it did you just say to the wife hey i've got a great idea i'm just going to get on a plane and fly to greece and run 153 miles in two days well i saw an article in one of the newspapers here and it explained about the Spartathlon. I'd never even heard of the Spartathlon and it was explained. This this reporter, who was also a fairly serious athlete, um, decided to have a go. He, he didn't actually manage to complete it, but it sounded fantastic. And reading that article, it, it kind of stayed with me. And yeah, I suddenly re-evalued the marathon, thinking, no, that's not the race I should be doing. This is the race we should be doing. But you know, I'm getting older, you know, <laughs> is it possible to do that kind of distance? How can you run that? I'm not an ultra runner. I've never run that kind of distance. I've done a few, mar done a few marathons, but never run anything like that. Can, how can you do that? Um, and it just kept gnawing away at me. And as I say, I'm getting older and I thought, um, there's a novel by Primo Levi called If Not Now, When? And I just always think those are, that's a very powerful question. If not now, when? And, and that's true of so many things in life. You know, I mean, we're going to die, you know. <laughs> the time is getting short. So I thought, yeah, okay, I'll, let's see if I can do this. And, but I realised I couldn't possibly do the, the actual race. I, would, they wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't be accepted. There's, a, I think, a limit of 400 runners. And you have to be, you know, you have to be a running god to just get in the competition. But I thought, well, I'll go kind of a week after it 
and just on my own see if I can do it. So that's what I did. Yeah, my wife, you'd say about my wife, <laughs> she wasn't thrilled at the idea. Um, and in fact, she was so worried about it that the night before I was due to, <laughs> to go down to Heathrow to get the flight, I said to my wife, I'm just going to see these two friends. I won't be long. And I actually had rewritten my will <laughs> because, because she was concerned that I was not going to come back from this experience. I'm glad we can, I'm glad we can laugh about this because it does sound, at least you're smiling about it now, it sounds like you, you, you set off with a sense of, I'm interested in this, I wonder if I'm capable, nothing to lose, at least I've rewritten my will. I mean, is that pretty much sum it up? Yes, I mean, I was hoping, I said to my sons just before I left, I said, you know, there's a very good chance I won't be able to do this. Although, having said that, I did kind of feel that, well, I'm probably going to manage to do the distance. But even if I end up walking it, which I did, I walked a whole load of it. I walked probably half of it. It took me four days. So, you know, I slept three nights mm -hmm. in the course of this. Um. But that doesn't matter to me, really. I just want to see if one man by himself, without any support, can actually do this. And, I, you know, I think that's not bad, actually. <laughs> Absolutely, it's not bad. And all the more so because Peter found himself going, well, let's call it the long way around. I did actually get lost quite a few times. I didn't follow the proper route. And yeah, I got lost quite a lot. And I, I think I probably actually ran about 175 miles, or not run, but I covered 175 miles. So I did considerably more than the distance, which is probably why it took me right. yeah, an excellent length of time. Right, so on top of the six marathons, you just ran another one for bonus. It was like buy six, get, yeah, buy six, get one like free. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm, yeah, what fascinates me about this is the whole sort of unsupported uh, – element I, I, again for given your past there has to be a degree of i'm hoping there's a degree of common sense and training in there but there's so many things that come to mind i mean what do you take with you to 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 be out for three or four nights in greece what kind of weather were you dealing with what do you what do you do for hydration where do you stay at night all of these things that if you're in a uh, you know on an organized trip somebody else takes care of for you so what how did you address these different yeah yeah, I mean, if part of the object of this little, you know, podcast or whatever it is we're doing here is to encourage others to have a go at something similar, then I most certainly want to encourage you to, to do it. Because one of the things which almost sounds uh, difficult to believe, I'm not that keen on running, quite frankly. Um, you know, I have lots of friends in the running club who love going out every day and running. I'm not like that. I, you give me the slightest excuse not to bother running, and I'll take it. I, uh, the hard, for me, the hardest bit is getting the kit on. Once I get the kit on, okay, I'll go. But, but I, I don't particularly like it. And I don't, didn't do masses of training for this. I'd run quite a few long distances. Had I done, I think I'd maybe done two marathon distances that year by myself and I did go out one night I left at I don't know six o'clock in the evening running with a pack with a sleeping bag and a bivy bag in uh, and I went and I ran till it got you know midnight one o'clock and I slept in a field and I, I ran back again but the, the total distance was I think 34 miles I ran yeah 17 miles out and then 17 back actually running in the dark if you've never done it before it's quite a daunting experience. I'm always conscious that, you know, we are diurnal animals. And as soon as it's getting dark, we are kind of out of our element. And you get a little, fit, not, there's no reason to be, but you do get, I think, psychologically fearful. Peter took a backpack with him, complete with a sleeping bag and change of clothes. He made it as light as he could. But I must say when I did it, I still ended up sort of halfway around throwing some of the clothing away, decided, you know, uh, you're carrying too much. And I did find it quite hard to carry that amount of stuff, which is why the second time I did it again a year later, 
and I absolutely honed the kit down to the bare essentials. Well, let's jump ahead to that because uh, I would have thought once was enough. Why did you go back the next year? Because although I was very happy to complete it the first time, I did feel slightly disappointed that I got lost so much and that four days I did feel I could do better than that. I'm not kind of too bothered about personal best. I've no idea what my, you know, 10 kilometers. I've no idea what my PB. I don't bother with that. I don't run with watches or anything. It just, you just run. But I did feel that four days, that was, I could, I could do it in three. I felt, yeah, I could do it in three. Really. I think, um, I think there's quite a human instinct, if, uh, if I may, that, that we do, we take on something that's kind of difficult. And sometimes it does test us to the point we say we can't do it again. But very, very often we take on something difficult. And we say, yeah, actually, I want to learn from from what I went through. I don't mean necessarily mean the mistakes because it can be a great experience. But it, it, there's definitely a sense of, no, I can do that better. Can we do that? Can we do that again? It's worth doing it again, whatever it is you're doing, because your knowledge level and experience has just you know, it exponentially in- increase. You go on the first thing and you're totally ignorant of it. You don't know, you've never done this before. How can you know what, what's involved? But of course, the second time, you know lots about it and you're so much yeah, in mentally, physically, preparation, everything. You just know so much more about it. And so obviously you're going to do it so much better. First time, yes, I had too much stuff in a sense. The weather was hot which is why I ended up throwing some of the clothing away. And I I think I was mentally weak. I stopped the first night and I'd only done about, I don't know, 45 miles or something. And I was running through some seaside town. uh, And there were people on the pavement, at cafes and all having a good time. And it had got dark. It was half 10 at night. And yeah, you just thought, oh, you know, let's... Yeah, you're really tired, obviously. Let's, I'll stop as well, kind of thing. And I ended up stopping and found someone that would put me up for the night. It was like an Airbnb almost, really. Put me up for the night and I just collapsed in the shower and got up the following day and carried on. Uh, And the second night, I struggled to find anywhere to sleep and I ended up having to get a taxi to a hotel and then get the taxi back again to my starting point. Fortunately, on the third night, he was on the receiving end of some of the hospitality that really does greet strangers on their travels more frequently than they might realise. I was going through a little village on the other side. You go up a big mountain, coming down the mountain to this tiny village. And it was now 11.30 at night. And I, I looked into what was kind of like a bar, but really almost just like somebody's back room, really. And there were about five guys sat around the table drinking, drinking beers. And they knew obviously what I was doing because it's on the route of the Spartathlon. They must wonder why the hell I'm there sort of two weeks after everybody else has come through when everybody was on the street of this village clapping them as they all come through. They think, yeah, well, you know, who's this crazy guy? So they knew what I was doing and they very kindly took me. There was a school building, but there were no children in the village anymore. The school was all closed, but they had the key and they opened the key to this school and there was a couch kind of in the headmaster's office, as it were. And they just let me sleep on this couch. And then the following morning, I, I carried on. So that was really nice. The second year, I decided, no, I need to just keep going. You know, don't weaken. Don't ignore the people at the cafe and all the rest of it. you just got to keep going for longer. Uh, and so I didn't take a sleeping bag on the second year, I took a a silk liner, just the liner, which was kind of about that size, you know, nothing really. Uh, Unfortunately, the second year was one of the worst um, weather periods for that time of year in Greece for 40 years. They had a cyclone uh, when it was the Spartathlon. This time as well, I went just after the Spartathlon. It finishes on the Saturday, starts on the Friday, finishes on the Saturday. I started my running on the Monday. And so I had very little kit this time. And unfortunately, the weather was quite cold. So when I came to stop the first night, which I just slept by the roadside, uh, I was I put everything that I had on, which was very little. I just couldn't keep warm, really. 
uh, with hindsight, I actually think I shouldn't even have bothered trying to sleep, that I probably should have just carried on through the night. But I had set off the second year in order to maximize the time. I left Athens just after midnight and I ran all through the early hours of the morning, through the day, and it got to half 11 at night. So I've been going for 23 and a half hours, which in itself, yeah, I've never done that before. That's a long time. I've never been on my feet for that length of time, really. I just felt, oh, you know, let's, I need to stop. I think, in fact, I probably could have kept going, really. Do they try and arrange the Spartathlon for a time of year that's, that's uh, at least bearable? They do it at the time of year of the Battle of Marathon. They do it when Pheidippides did it, which is late September, early October. I'm just thinking, I mean, it sounds like it's, it's, it's what we call autumn, but at the same time, Greece is the Mediterranean. It's quite far south. I mean, you know, it's still going to be warm that time of year. What does it get up to during the day when you're running? It could be 40 degrees in the middle of the day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I mean that's so uh, the, the, one of the other questions. Then, what did you did you bring your own food, or did you kind of just pick things up as you uh, ran through villages or walked through villages? What I found out the first time was the route is marked on the road. Now, I didn't find that out till I had already done about sixty miles, which was why I was getting lost so much. And so I was delighted when I found out that there were these big yellow arrows painted on the road with SP at the side for Sparta. And so after the sixth, first, however far I'd done, I, I then was okay on the route. Somebody explained to me about these arrows. Yeah, you, you're not looking for them. You, you just don't notice them, really. Yeah, the first year, it was terrible. I went into a village and I asked a lady, you know, Spartathlon, and she gave me direction, but I either misunderstood or went the wrong way. And I left this village and I ran for several miles up a hill. Uh, I was carrying a compass as well. And for a while it was okay. And then I thought, ah, this is, I'm going the wrong, this isn't the way I want to be going really. But I had to kind of keep going on this route. And eventually I came down into a village and it turned out, I was kind of 300 yards from the village that I'd left an hour and a half ago. Well, I mean, that's really depressing. <laughs> it is. And I'm glad you're laughing because when I did the world journey in uh, 2016, I had a few adventures like that. So it was in that village that I then asked somebody else and they said, you know, are you wanting to do the official route? And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, of course I am. And they pointed at the road and showed me these yellow arrows. And thereafter, it's pretty straightforward. Peter's method of rehydration proved equally, let's say, ad hoc. I began to notice that in the ditch at the side of the road would be lots of water bottles that the previous, the actual genuine athletes had just, you know, they'd taken a swig out the bottle and then just thrown them at the side of the road. And I began to notice that some of them still had lots of water in. And in fact, some of them hadn't even been opened. You know, the, the seal was still on the bottle. But some of them were maybe, you know, two thirds full. They'd just taken a couple of swigs, put the top on and thrown it. And, uh, you know, in those conditions, it might sound awful and you're going to catch some awful disease or something. But, you know, needs must. I picked these up, looked at it. Yeah, the water's clean. It's been there. How long? In the in the first case, it had been there about 10 days. But one of the reasons why the second time I did it, I went so soon after the marathon, is I knew that bottle of water has only been there two days. And that was my water supply. I'm really glad you honed in earlier uh, on on yeah, the reason I wanted to talk to you and, and the fact that it's not about just that you could do this incredible run, though I am utterly in awe of the fact that you did it, that other people can find other things that they can do. You know, for you, it was a combination of history and, you know, just wondering if you were capable of this particular event and you hadn't been able to pull off the other two that were, you know, formed, formed part of the trio of them. Um, it's also important to me that not everything that we talk about doing comes to the high cost. And it did strike me that if you're based in the UK and Greece is a popular holiday destination, this didn't necessarily need to come with a, a hefty financial tag, did it? 
No, no, very, very cheap. Especially that time of year, the the holiday season is finished. Really, you know, kids have gone back to school, so you're not competing with the bulk of British holidaymakers going to Greece. So you could get a flight pretty cheaply. Um, I booked an Airbnb, you know, one night in the Airbnb. I also kind of booked it for a week later for when I was going to come back. I left, you know, my bag of stuff in the Airbnb and, you know, said I'll be back in a week's time. Say the second year when it takes me three days, <laughs> you're spending next to nothing, you know. <laughs> what are you spending? You're really just running. Yeah, I mean, I, I stop by a cafe and maybe buy some bread or a sandwich or something, a block of cheese or a banana, but, you know, you're not spending any money. I'm still doing the math on this, and you, you, you know, you referenced a couple of times earlier you're not getting any younger. I could ask politely how old you were in you know, the first year that you did it, because I do think it's in, it, you know, that's an encouraging factor even of itself. So, 2017, when you did it, you would have been. Uh, well, I'm going to be, and uh, this coming January I'll be 70. Mm. So I am hoping to do it again because, yeah be nice to do it when i'm 70 kind of thing so you did it when you were 66 yeah 66 yeah yeah and that's 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 amazingly impressive and and you must have the second time then when you're 67 you had to have if you did it in three days you had to have covered 50 miles a day and you told me you've already said that you don't particularly love running uh when i've seen you run you look reasonably happy but maybe that's my company i don't know um but yeah you're saying you don't particularly love running you just sort of like the idea of doing things so i really want to get that across to somebody who um may think that they could no way have this in them to pull it off successfully uh is it a matter of pacing yourself and can you you know can you speak to whether you did suffer exhaustion and how you know, how you felt and whether there were these proverbial walls that you had to get through to be able to continue. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's, yeah, it's hard, but I mean, that's the, in a sense, that's the whole point, isn't it? I mean, it's the, it's the Kennedy line, isn't it? We don't do it because it's easy. We do it because it's hard. I mean, particularly in my case, you know, what, what I like about it, is that I am absolutely on my own, that there is, this isn't an organized event. There's no backup. You know, if it goes wrong, I'm going to have to fix it. There's, this is as kind of near as it get to the Pheidippides experience. Yeah, if all you've ever done is organized marathons where there's water stations and there's the medical facilities and there's the crowd, it, you know, um, I think I've maybe just sent you the link to the Spartathlon video because they're hoping to do it th this year, later this year. And they've got this little promotional video and it's showing you all these athletes running through villages and everybody's <laughs> clapping and cheering. And, you know, it, on your own, you, you don't have any of that. There's nobody encouraging you at all. You know, and you get to the end traditionally there's a big statue in sparta which is king leonidas you're just at his toe level and you kiss his toe there's this big polished brass toe that you kiss bronze toe you kiss that but i mean i just go and i got there second time it was about seven o'clock at night you know nobody's around on the on the real thing of course you know there's grandstand and everybody cheering and clapping and photographers and newspaper and all the rest of it there's, there's nobody there when I'm there. I just go and kiss his foot. And then, you know, you look at your watch, and say, well, I need to find a hotel, you know, what, where, where am I going to get the hotel? And you just go to a hotel and go to your room and crash out on the shower floor. I think what's great about you, you doing that is you do something that sounds incredibly difficult and is, is a, a, a great achievement and then but it's also very very humbling so in one sense you've completed this incredible journey and you have every reason to feel great about yourself at the same time to be honest the universe doesn't care does it no no absolutely no no it means nothing to anybody else no no you just for all you know i could be making the whole thing up <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i think you know things like the new york marathon the boston marathon you know fantastic events uh, I'd quite like to do one sometime. I never have done that kind of marathon, but you know, yeah, why not? It's, it's a great thing to do. And so I would encourage anyone to, to do that. And 
if you're not used to that, if you've never done a marathon before, the crowd, I'm sure, as I say, I've never run with a crowd, but I'm sure that will be tremendously beneficial to you and will keep you going. You know, it's not that I'm critical of that. It is just that running by yourself, I think, is a very different experience. What The other thing I want to point out, if we're trying to encourage people, is what I've been conscious of ever since doing both of them, really, is that it has been a kind of life-changing event. Within me, there is a much, there's more, there's more confidence, really. I mean, I, I've always been a reasonably confident person, but not a, I don't mean a kind of brash confidence, but a, a realisation that y- you can kind of do anything, really. If you just set your mind to it, keep going, plod on, y- you will get it done, whatever it is. That what seemed unachievable how could you possibly do this actually you know it's the gandhi thing isn't it you know the the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step but you just you just can do it you can do it we can all do it in a sense but the thing is you have to get out there and and start A couple of historical footnotes that serve to stress the importance of the Battle of Marathon. By repelling the Persians, the Athenians were able to continue and improve their form of governance known as Democratia, or what we call democracy, and which, for all its many faults in its multitude of different forms, we nonetheless continue to practice in the Western world, albeit that sometimes it feels like it is hanging by a thread. As for the Spartans, They marched over to Marathon after the full moon, as they said they would, apparently in just three days themselves, and of course, like Pheidippus before them, found that the battle had taken place. Apparently they had themselves a jolly old time inspecting the battlefield and assuring themselves that the Athenians would be no easy pushovers in the wars that duly followed. A little more about Peter Naylor's work. Some of his memorial sculptures pay homage to military history, in particular one for the Women's Land Army, which was unveiled in 2014 by none other than Prince Charles. Other notable sculptures of his include memorials to the lost trawlermen of Hull, the city closest to Beverly, which lost some 6,000 deep-sea fishermen in 100 years before the industry collapsed, largely due to overfishing. Peter's also created one in memory of the Pendle Witches, the last so-called, but of course, witches, to have been hung in the UK back in 1612. He's also got one dedicated to Harriet Quimby, the first woman, an American woman, to fly across the English Channel back in 1912, an achievement that should have made the front pages had the news of the Titanic sinking not relegated her to a historical footnote instead. You can see more of Peter's work at his website, peternaylor.co.uk where in the forthright fashion that he revealed over the course of this interview he's listed his mailing address, email address and phone number should you wish to contact him. His wife Philippa is an artist in her own right probably the only Brit to have three quilts in the National Quilt Museum of the United States in Paducah, Kentucky. This episode of One Step Beyond was written, produced and narrated by Tony Fletcher. Incidental music in this episode was revealed in this nature by Noel Fletcher. The theme song One Step Beyond is by Madness, used with their permission, and the logo is by Mark Lerner. You can reach out to us at onestepbeyond at ijamming.net I-J-A-M-M-I-N-G dot net You can also find us on all social media. Just search One Step Beyond Podcast. And our website is buried over at acast.com. All these links will be supplied in the show notes. And if you are listening online, please know that you can subscribe and download on just about every podcast platform known to man. It's always great if you want to leave a positive review. 
and it's especially great if you want to reach out. Whatever you're doing in the world, peace.